Hermit Society, Volume 1, Three Days of Night, Chapter 1, Doomer. 12.12 12 a.m., Tuesday with Mikhail. Down the street from the Chinese grocery store, between where they just opened the town's best Taco Bell and the town's worst rallies, I stumbled one evening upon a headless body. Rather, I stumbled over it. I would soon realize that it was not, in fact, a corpse, but that moment of horror and shock would have to wait in line behind the natural initial one, which itself only came after my drunken flailing to understand why the hell I was on the ground all of a sudden. I was entering the stage of deliberation over whether I should call the cops or flee the scene when the headless body rose to its feet. Quite sorry. I could later remember a voice having sprack in a quaintly smooth British accent before being cut off by my uncontrolled screaming. It had come from somewhere inside of the body, muffled by the cage of flesh surrounding it and its brown leather jacket, which seemed a size too small, stopping just shy of its megatite light blue jeans. I only know this because when I regained consciousness in its house, it had somehow managed to calmly explain to me that I'd fainted, in what it considered understandable terror. I was a lot too drunk for headless humanoid. I said, grammar faltering beneath the waves of agony rippling through my hungover and hopefully not concussed cranium. Through barely functioning eyes, I found myself on a large and comfortable couch in a very average, if absurdly well-maintained, living room. You seem to have come to terms with exceptional speed, it responded. I had started to realize that the slight reverb on its voice wasn't just a result of my ringing ears, but because there was nothing inside of its body any deeper than the skeleton. It was hollow. You could take a flashlight to its neck hole and see down to the bones of its feet, which I would do eventually. You aren't my first... thing, I responded, meaning no disrespect. I added, figuring no matter how much pain I was in, I should at least be polite to someone taking care of me. Or, well, some thing, anyways. None assumed. What I am hasn't been titled by human society. What do you consider yourself? I don't care much for labels. My name, however, is Chamomile. Would it be rude to ask how you got it? Humans, of course, are usually named by their parents or themselves, but I had a funny feeling that this might not be the case here. Not at all, but it is a long story. I do enjoy the chance to share company, but I'm in no hurry if you'd like to wake up before a lengthy conversation. You're a very good... Um, I don't want to assume anything. Call me whatever you like. My voice is a low baritone, my body has breasts, my clothes are to my own taste, my manner is inhuman. Quite frankly, I am completely indifferent. A good man, then, if it's all the same to you. In a void, I go with first impressions. Fair enough. You obviously drink. Shall we have mimosas with something greasy until you're well enough for a walk? You must know something about me if you're willing to open a bottle of champagne for a strange drunk. Well put, detective. Or whatever it was you specifically consider yourself. I'm no more a fan of labels than you are, but for the sake of argument, I am a doomer. 3.57 a.m. Wednesday with Hermes. When I was a kid, I remember one of the coolest scenes I'd ever watched was when Spike Spiegel got shoved through a second floor stained glass window in Cowboy Bebop. I even remember writing my own script a few years later containing a similar scene, prohibiting it from being filmable on my budget and level of skill. This memory occupied me briefly on my fall from the fourth story window of a downtown apartment complex, in between internal screams at the extreme pain from the glass shards stuck in my neck and back. In retrospect, I decided it was bullshit that Spike had gotten away with just a body wrapped in bandages, considering how the fall had put a crater in my skull. But having been completely torn in half by a spiked metal fence was simply my own terrible luck at work. Had I died on the ground, the first to find my corpse might have been haunted by the smile I went out with, having witnessed the gratifying explosion which left the window behind me and undoubtedly destroyed the creature which had just thrown me from it. But graciously, death is between dancing and directing on the list of things I'm utterly incapable of. 
Still, it was no easy task for my reshaped torso to clamber the six-foot fence to where my lower half was waiting for reconnection. I managed to slip at the top, impaling my hand on a spike and leaving my upper body dangling helplessly from the fence as I yelped in pain once more. My legs had gotten up onto their feet, but the stubby fuckers were just an inch shy of my torso, and all the ligaments were dancing on the surface, begging for reattachment, just out of reach. I'd have to grab the spike in my other hand and viciously tear my hand loose before I could slop down, lopsided onto my own waist, and then adjust the seam until it fit. Thankfully, the brick-shitting chaos which had unfolded in and around the building as a result of the explosion meant no one had even noticed me standing in this weird little bottom floor backyard, and I had no reason to hang around since half of my enemy's badly charred face was lying here in the grass and rapidly dissolving in the 4am air. These things have brittle corpses. Hurrying from the scene, I ducked into the nearby alley where I'd left a sports bag containing a backup long sleeve t-shirt, sweats, and windbreaker, which I always kept handy in case things went the way they usually did. I changed out of my now bloodstained and tattered clothes before continuing to flee. When I'd gotten a couple of blocks away, I put in an Uber request and then texted Mikhail, pronounced me Kale for some reason, that the Berbergore was dead. That was just a name I'd come up with off the top of my head based on the vibe I had gotten from the encounter, and I knew Mikhail would understand. When the driver showed up, of course he asked if I knew where the hell that smoke was coming from, and I told him that something had blown up and that's why I was trying to get the hell out of here. Once he heard that, he took off at rocket speed. I hadn't needed to escape the scene quickly per se, but if I could get a faster ride just by being honest, then I didn't see why I wouldn't. Mikhail texted back, been talking to headless guy with tits for eight hours, we buddies now. I responded, I believe the politically correct term is trans woman, you insensitive fuck. He said it okay. Mikhail got back three minutes later, clearly drunk again. Die of alcohol poisoning, I demanded. I was already heading to the front door of the house by the time he responded, I can't, followed by a pistol emoji which he'd forgotten to point at anything. I shook my head and went into the house. Doomervale, as the owner called it, was home to three physical beings with five personalities between them, and was the base of operations for five or seven people, depending on how you counted. It was a sizable, single-floor, four-bedroom suburban home with a living room big enough to comfortably fly a drone in. My room was smack in the middle of the place, so I inevitably overheard bits and pieces of what everyone was up to, and generally had the most consistent contact with everyone that came and went. The front door opened straight into the giant den, which we deliberately rigged to look as much like a sci-fi control room as possible. There was a halo of huge monitors all along the top of the walls, and the far wall from the entrance was entirely encompassed by twelve of them in four columns, coming down to a waist-high desk. When you walked into the room, there would be hallways on your left and right leading to the rest of the house, but just beyond those, running along the walls until the desk at the back, were two long couches while in the center of the room was a circle of six mid-sized recliners facing outward. Just above the couches and below the monitor halo, there were two 70-inch screens per wall, these ones being what you'd use for casual viewing. There were no visible cords in the room, aside from those leading from armrests and the backs of couches to AT50 headphones mounted on hooks to the sides of each chair and to the walls between the big screen TVs. Strewn all over were universal remote controls with extended number pads that could be used to select any monitor in the room for control, or even disable all but certain ones at the press of a single button. The twelve tiny surround sound speakers affixed in corners all over the place could also be made to either play audio from a single source, or be set individually to play sound from multiple monitors at once. At a glance, any newcomer would have thought this an absurd and unnecessary display of opulence, but the reality is closer to an overzealous tech nerd's passion project. Every single one of these screens and the hidden computers connected to them had been purchased in bulk sales from companies going out of business. The couches and chairs were all products of extensive goodwill patrolling, and the headphone and speaker acquisition had been a process of taking a chunk from each paycheck over the course of two years. All of the wiring and setup had been done by the homeowner himself, and had a lot more to do with aesthetics than practicality, even if using the setup never failed to be fun and impressive just in itself. On nights like this one, though, where everyone was out of the house anyways and the monitors were all running screensavers, it was hard to think of it as anything but a big, gaudy waste of effort. 
Dwelling on it for little more than a second, I headed down the left hallway, plainly a twenty-foot straight shot to the master bedroom door with three doors along the way leading to two other bedrooms and a bathroom. Mine was the room on the left. When I opened the door, I damn near leapt out of my skin at the sight of a burly naked man on my bed, spread eagle and sporting a fully erect eight-inch cock. Jesus Christ, Dale! You couldn't send a text? You scared the shit out of me. I complained while tossing my coat to the ground. I thought it might turn you on, he replied. It did, but I need a shower before you're touching me with anything, I said, taking off my clothes in turn. As far as I knew, the place was otherwise empty, so I wasn't afraid to make the short trek to the bathroom naked. I'll join you then, he grinned, rising from the bed. Dale was my hypersexual hunk of a husband, a man who looked like he materialized out of a firefighter calendar or just got back from the set of a CW Superman show in which he played Superman. It was just as difficult to believe that he was actually real as it was to believe that he'd taken me as a partner. But if I'm being realistic, that had a lot more to do with our shared condition than it did with appearances. Indeed, if there were any meaningful difference between Dale and Superman himself, it would be that he was simply immortal instead of impervious. But while we shared in this trait, our other inhuman capabilities were distinctly our own. A regular human, going by what I understand from talking to them, probably would have relished in how the shower's hot water melted away the soreness of recent combat and the icy goosebumps left by the mid-January air, but my body was constantly auto-correcting itself to the most comfortable and functional status possible anyways. The only thing it couldn't do was to repel the stench of dirt and blood which had clung to its surface. Once the sound of rushing water and soft scent of soap had lulled the day's stress from my mind, and once I'd let Dale encompass me in his unshakably secure hug, I felt my sensitivity welling out, and without going into too many details, gladly took his cock. Back in the room, Dale regaled me in his usually brief but warmly delivered way about the course of his day. Dale didn't live at Doomervale, but was free to come and go as he pleased, and usually stayed the night with me if he didn't work the next day. In spite of his abilities, Dale was the only person in our friend group who didn't involve himself in any kind of supernatural business. He worked in real estate downtown, and his apartment was in the heart of the city. While I did frequent the area for my own work, it ultimately made more sense for me to live at Doomervale for the owner's gracious offering of its full facilities for the low cost of $300 a month in rent, which made this low turnover job even possible for me to live on. As for why I'd chosen this path in life... Quite simply, it gave me a sense of purpose that I wasn't creative enough to see in anything else. Of course, living apart from my spouse had its downsides, and we'd been discussing the possibility of getting our own place somewhere nearby, since Dale wouldn't mind the commute, but part of my decision to stay in this house had also been to assist with the emotional well-being of one of my best friends, the house's third, fourth, and fifth resident, Sarah slash Sayaka slash Serendipity. They'd been doing better lately and insisted that it would be okay for me to move away, as we weren't even around each other all the time anymore at this point, but I did get into this business because I'm a busybody who needs to look out for others in order to validate myself, and having such an unflappably secure and solid-built partner made it easy for me to forget about my own desires for more than what I had. I didn't end up telling Dale about what I'd been up to that evening. Frankly, I didn't even want to think about it. Even if it physically felt like nothing had happened by now, getting split in half had been among the top three most painful experiences of my 25-year life, and I wasn't ready to deal with the fresh mental scars that living through it had likely etched onto my brain, nor was I ready for the crash that always comes when the pride of having protected innocent lives and emerged victorious from a hard-fought battle gave way to the guilt of having taken a life. All of that could wait for morning. After a long night of tossing about in Dale's grip as nightmares danced across my psyche. Sleeping was the worst part of my job. Physical pain usually didn't take long to recover from, and as long as I was in full waking control of my mind, I could suppress the psychological trauma. But my unconscious psyche was free to try its hand at sorting through those horrors, and the sheer volume of repressed information colliding and sprawling out in incoherent narrative presentations sometimes led to dreams which outlasted my waking experiences for the day. Before I had someone holding me still through the night, I had gotten used to waking up on the floor across the room, but now at least I can rest my head knowing I'd be seeing my favorite face in the morning, and that cut down on the time I waited to lose consciousness considerably. 11.02 a.m. Wednesday with Trayvon When I woke on the third day without daylight, I started to wonder if it was going to come back. Weighing the pros and cons, I found myself indifferent to either eventuality. 
If the sun never shone on Breckensburg again, it would mean a lot of changes to the area. Ideally, the formation of an artificial daylight grid around the city. But more likely, people would just leave en masse until the city's economy totally crumbled. The confusion was already costing it gobs of money, though for now at least it was a surge in tourism and lots of visitation from important people attempting to comprehend the phenomenon. Speaking from my personal perspective, it seemed likely that this was yet another of the city's rampant, unnatural phenomena, but a much more open and obvious one than usual. A case so perplexing that it didn't feel the need to hide itself, as it didn't believe that anyone could solve it. Perhaps even a deliberate challenge to anyone who'd have reason to take it as one. At least, I certainly took it as one. My friends Mikhail and Hermes had thrown their hands up in disinterest right away, given that there wasn't any bounty going around. It would seem that when a phenomenon affects everyone in the city, as opposed to a single individual, no one's willing to take responsibility for hiring someone to deal with it. Quite a shame, too, as any of us would probably take to the streets for a regular asking price, but we can't exactly advertise our services in a public fashion. It's the kind of thing you find out about when you need to know about it, though in cases where the source of the problem is so unfathomable that you can't even register the nature of it, even needing to know won't necessarily lead you in the right direction. Those who'd employed us were sworn to strict secrecy, upheld by their fear of our abilities. Thankfully for everyone, their city has a benevolent benefactor in the form of me. Yes, I, who'd spent two days on shots in the literal dark and made no progress in solving this problem, which, in my opinion, wasn't really a problem at all. Nonetheless, I wasn't ready to give up. I'd spent a hell of a lot longer than this trying to solve other paranormal mysteries, even if this was the first case where I'd gone so long without a single meaningful lead. Asking all of my connections, studying the phenomenon from every angle I could think of, and combing over the more technical data which authorities were collecting about it hadn't helped in the slightest. I was a little concerned that such a high-profile incident might lead attention to my group somehow, especially if we were poking our heads around, but honestly there wasn't anything to implicate us or any other weirdo with involvement. The only reason I even suspected abnormal activity is because I happened to deal with it every day. The only doomer I had helping me on the case was Rosetta Blackwood, a 23-year-old girl holed up in a nearby apartment whom I tended to contract for my own personal projects, since she wasn't likely to act on her own or take other jobs without direction. Thanks to her mind flight ability, which allowed her mind's eye to travel independently of her body and see anything she cared to, I liked to employ her in cases where leads were sparse enough that totally random searching might actually be the best way forward. But I'd already dumped a few hundred bucks into having her fly around for some 20 of the last 53 hours, and she was as disinterested in continuing the frustratingly fruitless search as I was in spending more money on it. For a while, I'd stood in the middle of the living room, encircled by the six recliners, staring up at my screen array full of footage of the many cameras I'd stationed along ley lines throughout the city, but there was even less weird activity than usual going on, and a lot of the areas just weren't visible to my cheap cameras in the darkness. Upgrading my setup had always been, and likely would always remain, a constant work in progress, and it seemed like every time I really needed a piece of equipment, that would be the one I hadn't gotten around to updating yet. Serendipity had made a rare appearance in the living room to stare with me for a while just out of boredom, but as tends to happen when she's around, we ended up losing focus and making out on the couch instead. After taking it to the bed and eventually putting her to sleep, she didn't show up again, and Sayaka was absolutely uninterested. Hermes had gone about his business as usual for the last two days, wrapping up another case, which I would later learn ended in a pretty violent clash against something he'd called a burpagore. His naming sense was generally awful, and would probably be sleeping in for most of the next day since his husband was over on a day off. Rising from the bed and checking my phone, I found a drunk text from Mikhail sent at 5 in the morning stating that he, quote, knew everything about everything, which I couldn't parse and wasn't going to get a follow-up on until he woke up God knows when, so I decided not to think about it until I heard from him. I was much more hesitant to open the second text which I'd received that night, from a girl whose relationship with me was increasing in complication over the past week or so. At 21, she was eight years my junior, and I'd made the mistake of taking her virginity on the pretense of indulging her curiosity over finally making a sexual debut. Serendipity and I had maintained a purely sexual relationship for years, but this girl was floating around more attached language than I'd been prepared for, and it was steadily becoming apparent that there wasn't anything I could say to her in honesty which was going to end with her being happy. 
I thought about it, and I realize, given the way we've been going, that I'm probably not the only person you're seeing. I still want to see you, though. I'm new to all of this, and I trust you still, so can we try to work something out? Find a way for this to make sense? The puzzle this girl was proposing sounded less solvable to me than the one I was already focused on, and unlike that one, I wanted to stay as far from it as possible. Even still, I wasn't going to be able to ignore her for long. She was a powerful doomer and interested in helping our group, at least insofar as being useful to me. If I just hadn't stuck my dick where it didn't need to be, we could have maintained a professional relationship. Maybe I could have hooked her up with someone else. But it's not every day that a heart-stoppingly gorgeous five-foot blonde starts making eyes at me, and frankly, I just wasn't thinking with my brain. It would be a lie to tell her I was busy figuring out the source of the city's eternal night on account of it truly having been none of my business and my having made no progress at all. Even having had the thought to type such a thing led me to wonder if I was only pursuing the case so ardently so that I could avoid this conversation. But at this point, I was about willing to indulge it just for the chance to shake up the monotony of researching nothing at all. After an hour of sipping coffee and pondering everything at hand in the den, I realized that the worst thing about Eternal Nights is the feeling that nothing can progress. 1.10 p.m. Monday with Kyla To be perfectly honest, the main reason I'd started dating Rosetta Blackwood was just because the dating pool for lesbian doomers isn't exactly expansive, and regardless of her personality, appearance-wise, she was exactly my type. Things had gone well enough over the past couple of months, but there would be a lot I'd have to get used to if we were going to continue going steady long term. For one thing, it was nearly impossible to get her to leave her room. Now, I'm not exactly a socialite myself, but when statements like, I think I'd like to eat at Macaroni Grill tonight, are returned with the question, will you be coming back here afterward? I have to wonder exactly how much Asperger's is more than I'm prepared to live with. Moreover, she had a tendency to get extremely focused on work whenever she took a job, even though she only did so at the random whims of her occasional employer, Trayvon, who seemed to be some kind of weird doomer file without any powers of his own. In today's case, however, I was eager to leave her to it if she could be of any help because it was actually affecting me too. While I might not be much of an outdoor person, I'd taken to tanning and reading a book in the mornings both to keep my vitamin D levels up and so I didn't look like such a pasty ghost next to my naturally tan-skinned girlfriend. Besides, it was just depressing to wake up at nine for once and realize that the sun hadn't even risen with me. Trey said he'd pay for up to ten hours of flight today, she'd texted me, which I took to mean, I will be totally ignoring you for the rest of the afternoon, so I decided I'd keep myself occupied by doing my own footwork. Your girlfriend isn't going to find anything, I was told by a feminine voice from a small speaker affixed to the neck of an ostrich whose head was, as always, buried in the ground. You sound awfully sure of yourself. What do you know? I asked sincerely. If you know anything about ostriches, you probably know that they don't actually put their heads in the ground in real life, and as such will not be surprised when I tell you that this was no ordinary ostrich, if the fact that it could talk didn't give it away, I mean. Nothing unexpected is happening in Breckensburg today, she informed. This ostrich named Sally was able to sense the vibrations of every single movement in a 10-mile radius of her location and to parse all of that sensory data instantaneously. Having said that, her definition of what is or isn't expected was also fundamentally warped by her weird perspective on normalcy and Holmesian powers of prediction. A meteor could wipe out half the town and send the other half into panic, and she'd tell you that nothing unexpected was happening because everyone was reacting as you would expect them to in the event of a meteor strike. Is anything, you know, different happening? I asked, even though I knew that the answer was yes and that this line of questioning wasn't leading anywhere. Dozens of new presences entering the city and dozens of old presences leaving. Nothing you wouldn't imagine as the result of this incident. Whether I actually could predict the movements of the town or not, I could certainly predict her responses like clockwork. Well, thanks anyways. I tossed a ghost pepper into her pen and took my leave of the depressingly darkened zoo, which I'd had to sneak into on account of its closure for obvious reasons. I figured that Trey and Rose were going to be looking in the obvious places first so I would take a jagged route through more obscure ones, but I wasn't exactly expecting results. 
Really, I was just bored. School had closed for the day in the widespread quiet panic sweeping through the city, as had most of the local businesses, and I didn't feel like exploring the local hangouts in the dark while everyone was on edge. This small suburban city wasn't going to reach any kind of looting fever pitch, but I'd be shocked if the crime statistics weren't already rising. The only saving grace keeping the normals indoors was that January in Breckenburgs is stupid cold. After wandering the streets and checking the levels on various spirit meters which Trayvon had stationed near his secret cameras on the ley lines, which I figured he probably couldn't even see in the dark and had no other way of monitoring, I started to feel the futility of my random efforts sinking in, so I stumbled into a Burger King just because I thought it was hilarious that they had to stay open in this situation. I probably shouldn't have been surprised that it was packed, and therefore the already shitty Wi-Fi was being choked. At least the 30 second load times on every page of the town subreddit were giving me a chance to wolf down a couple of Whopper Juniors bought with the fast food chain's ever-present coupons. Amid pages of complaints and concerns, I found myself fixated on a very brief, strangely cryptic post reading, 459 Still Walkin' Blind. Clicking the username, I found it was posted on a brand new account created only the day before. If it meant anything at all, then it certainly wasn't obvious, and could just as easily have been completely unrelated to the actual cause of this solar blackout, but I was fascinated enough to write it down and stow it away for consideration as something to give further thought to. It was nearing 4 p.m. when I'd made my way down to the town center, where the city's only couple of skyscrapers stood amid a two-block cluster of higher-end stores and restaurants. There were several reasons I'd opted out of joining the ragtag band of self-styled superheroes and bounty hunters who called themselves the Hermit Society, to which my current girlfriend belonged. I did resonate with the core feeling that brought them together, a desire to mend the doomer's always long-broken ego by working together towards the noble goal of helpfulness, even if at a low cost to customers necessary for subsistence. They seemed like good enough people, and I didn't mind hanging around them on occasion or even helping out if I had the time and energy, but at the heart of the matter was that I simply didn't gel with their overall methodology. Maybe I just had the privilege of less emotional damage as compared to the others, but the thought of cuddling up into a bubble of like-minded comrades and the total ignorance of anyone outside beyond their pertinence to myself was unappealing to me. It also wasn't the best use of my powers, insofar as I understood them. Like most Doomers, I'd been granted with a certain brand of deathlessness. I could age, and assumably would eventually deteriorate and die, but whatever my body currently considered to be its most appropriate shape would be consistently maintained. As far as I could prove, this may very well have been my only abnormal ability, but if so, then it meant it was simply a coincidence that I always seemed to find myself in the right place at the right time. For instance, had I not happened to be in the town center at 4 p.m. and happened to have stumbled upon that bizarre Reddit post, then I neither would have witnessed the sudden bizarre flash of light which blasted from the top floor windows of the Art Institute building for five seconds, nor had any reason to give them any additional thought. If I didn't make a point to follow my own whims at all times, I had a feeling that moments like this would never happen. And besides, if I could beat Trey and Rose to the punch, it would be the perfect revenge for leaving me alone and bored for however long this was going to take to figure out. You've done it again, Kyla, I muttered with a smile, and made my way towards the building. Doomer, over. So this has been Chapter 1 of a story that I was writing back, let's see, last edit was on June 11th, but that was my, that was my recent re-edits, let's see here, yeah, August 2019, so I was writing this, I guess I was writing this mostly in January of 2019, I wrote a little bit more in July and August, and then touched it up uh, recently, just like the first chapter, I think, um, but yeah, uh, this was a story that was just like uh, I started writing it very suddenly. I didn't tell anybody about it because I thought that um, it was the kind of project that I was like, I want to complete this whole thing and then start talking about it. Um, but I kind of became self-conscious about it the more I wrote of it because I didn't entirely know where I wanted the story to go. I have written like chapter two is so far longer than chapter one, but it is not complete. It, it is it is nearly complete, but not quite. Um, so I could uh, just go ahead and touch that up and finish it real quick and read it if people are interested and then continue the story. 
I do think that this story is a little bit difficult to comprehend because I, my writing is too tight. Like there's not enough. Uh, there's there's a few places where there's too much detail and it's hard to visualize all of it. And then there's other places where there's not enough detail. And um, like the very beginning, the way that it's written is, is kind of deliberately confusing because Mikhail is like trying to recall this drunken memory. And it's like the way he talks is kind of backwards, uh, which is part of his personality. And it'll come through more in, in future chapters with him that I've written. But, um, you know, each of the characters kind of has their own voice that I tried to literally give them just now by reading them with different voices. Um and uh yeah the the hopefully you know this wasn't confusing or hard to follow because there is a lot going on in this story it gets easier to follow the more the longer it goes as you hear the characters repeat one another's names and uh the timetable starts to add up more if you couldn't tell that you know the the first part was on tuesday the second part was on wednesday um and the the third part was also on Wednesday, but later in the day. And then we jump back to Monday before the other two or before anything else that we had seen so far. So, yeah, it's it's anachronically told, bouncing between various perspectives. There are even more character perspectives in Chapter 2 that we have not gotten to yet um, as we unravel this uh, this story about um, the the three days in which the town of Breckensburg is enshrouded in night and um, the the people who are trying to figure out why and put a stop to it but also intersected with a story about uh, this creature called the Burpagor that is uh, going around killing people that Hermes has to deal with um, you know so yeah more more of this could happen if people are interested let me know what you thought of this story i i am aware that it could be edited and made better but i just want to like measure basic interest like, i'm not really looking for like technical advice with this because i am aware that it is like over tight there are you know difficulties in reading it if i were to like let's say finish this story maybe i would go back through with an editor and touch it up or something um but I, uh, you know, my, my basic interest in this is just in completing it if that is something that people are interested in. But I, I don't know if these characters will resonate with people, if this writing style resonates with people. I know there are some people who just anything I do, they're automatically going to say, yeah, I want more of it just because it's it potentially cool. But, you know, uh, let me know what you think and I'll, I'll, I'll finish up chapter two.